Hey there, all you cool cats and kittens. Welcome to chapter two of my career as a cinematographer. Uh, okay, so today we are going to study Araby by James Joyce. And I'm always really excited when this happened. This is my favorite thing to teach. I'm really excited. Uh, I've read it well over 200 times, and I can't wait for the 201st time. So it's so magnificent and so much fun. Uh, but it doesn't appear to be when you first read it. So if you would, uh, please get your copy out, either the book copy or um, a, uh, a digital copy. Um, as you hopefully know, you have, as a, uh, as a blend student, you have free access to the Norton ebook. Although, to be honest, you don't really need it. There are at least 8 billion uh, copies on the internet. <clears throat> so just go to you know, Google and type in Araby and PDF and it'll show up. Uh, anyway, so a few notes about James Joyce. <clears throat> James Joyce, uh, 1882 to 1941. He was born on February 2nd. I'm always really pleased about that because my birthday's in February too. That always uh, makes me really happy knowing I share the same birthday month as the greatest writer in the history of the world, not named Shakespeare. So, and it's, uh, yeah, I, I do believe it's true that Joyce is the greatest prose author <clears throat> in the history of the world. And like Shakespeare, he's ours. He belongs to the English language. So how great is that? Uh, all right. So uh, just some historical details about James Joyce. Uh, he was from Ireland, and he wrote very few things, actually. He wrote one, two, three, four books in his lifetime. Uh, but two of those books, <clears throat> Ulysses by James Joyce and Portrait of the Artist by James Joyce, <clears throat> were uh, ranked... <clears throat> the top two in just about every publication in the world at the end of the 20th century as the two greatest novels of the 20th century. Now, what we're going to read is a short story from his first book, which is a book of short stories called Dubliners. And as you might guess, it's just a bunch of short stories that are set in Dublin. And if you didn't know any better, you would read them in probably shrug and say, well, that seems interesting, or that's boring, or that seems like an interesting slice of life in the turn of the 20th century Ireland. And it may appear that way on the surface, but I think it was important to get you to read things like the yellow wallpaper and girl, uh, not just because they're great, magnificent stories, but also to get you prepared for doing some deep analysis into something that is much deeper and richer than what appears on the surface. Now, if it seems like I'm uh, you know, uh, more excited than usual, it's because of this story, and it's because of that particular issue, and that is the deeper you look into it, the more rich and spectacular it is. So uh, anyway, back to Joyce. Uh, <clears throat> Joyce was from Ireland. And let's say you only know two things about Ireland. Those two things are probably like in order Guinness and Catholics. Okay. And so uh, James Joyce was a Catholic. And he went to college at Trinity College in Dublin to become a priest. Uh, however, while he was an undergraduate, he changed his major to literature and uh, basically abandoned the Catholic Church. And then in his late teens and early 20s, he began to write. Now, what you should know about Araby is uh, all the stories in Araby were written before James Joyce was 25 years old. Araby was written when Joyce was about 21 years old which boggles my mind because he's basically your age and he wrote this thing. 
I just can't imagine. I could barely find my own butt when I was 21 years old. So anyway, back to uh, Joyce. Well, anyway, Joyce fell in love with a lovely young woman named Nora Barnacle. Not making that name up. That was really her name. And they fell in love. And he abandoned the Catholic Church. And he was very miserable in, uh, in Dublin for a couple of reasons. One is, in 1904, Dublin was an extremely miserable place. Uh, and <clears throat> to Joyce, part of that misery was the uh, unusually strong power that the church had on the town of Dublin. And basically, you can say that's true for all of Ireland. Now, I could spend a whole hour just talking about why Ireland is not just Irish, but so Irish. But a lot of it has to do with England becoming Protestant in the 16th century and outlawing Catholicism and so many tens of thousands of Catholics moving from England to Ireland in, uh, in the 1500s. <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> and then a hundred years later in the 1600s, Oliver Cromwell, you know, who was the, uh, the Lord Protector of England, sent his army over to Ireland and just slaughtered tens of thousands of Catholics, seized their lands, and uh, there was famine and misery. So uh, the Catholics are, I mean, uh, Ireland is not just any kind of Catholic. It is very deeply ingrained. Um, so, Ireland. <clears throat> Joyce and Nora left Ireland in 1904 and moved to the European continent and stayed there for the rest of their lives. Joyce only went back to Ireland twice from 1904 to 1941. One was to go to his mother's funeral and two was to uh, start the very first cinema in Dublin which is amazing. The guy who brought the movies to Ireland is James Joyce. So, uh, and then he didn't write, uh, he didn't publish his books uh, until he moved to Europe, but all the books that he wrote, Dubliners, Portraits of the Artist, Ulysses, and uh, Finnegan's Wake were all written uh, in, in Europe. Uh, so, Dubliners is, uh, it's about, <clears throat> it's about 12 stories. I can't remember the exact number, but, uh, the first three stories are told from a child's perspective and uh, they are first person narratives. Uh, <clears throat> and then all of the subsequent stories are told from the third person perspective. Now that's important because one of the things that Joyce was interested in was perspective. And, uh, and that is something that I hope you do. And that is when you read something, you ask the question, who is talking? Who is the person who is speaking? Can I rely on this person? Uh, so Joyce was fascinated with that. And so he has his first three stories narrated by uh, narr narrated from the perspective of a young man. Uh, in, in the case of Araby, a young boy. We're talking probably uh, during the story, he is maybe 11, 12, 13. You probably recognize this voice uh, because it may describe, you know, your first experience with falling in love. <clears throat> I know it does me. Um, <clears throat> But what you should know about the narrator is that he's not 11 or 12 or 13 when he's telling the story. He is much older remembering something that happened to him when he was 11 or 12 or 13 years old. So this is not a 12-year-old voice speaking. This is a man probably, I'm guessing, I'm interested in your perspective, but I'm guessing probably around 30 and he's remembering a moment. 
Now, what he's doing is something that appears in most Joyce stories, and that is a memory of an epiphany. And so uh, <clears throat> epiphany is, is an important term when you're talking about Joyce. <clears throat> uh, and that is <clears throat> a moment of realization. Now, what's fascinating to me about the epiphany is, is one, it makes for a good story. And that is you have a character, uh, he has a realization, okay, and then uh, and it's like this shining moment, um, and, then, and then he moves on. But what's interesting about the epiphanies in James Joyce stories is I'm convinced that, like me, Joyce doesn't believe that epiphanies exist for a simple reason. They don't exist, okay? There is not some shining road to Damascus moment in your life where you finally figure out what life is like or you finally, at that moment, find out who you are, okay? That doesn't exist. But it is a very deep-rooted fantasy that we all subscribe to and we all really want. But I hate to break the nose to you. It doesn't work that way. There, it's, there's really no such thing. And nobody knows it more than James Joyce, but he's fascinated with the with this idea of the epiphany. Now, you know, the epiphany is something that you can that you see in every romantic comedy, right? And that is, uh, you have uh, play out in the romantic comedy these romantic fantasies, and Araby is all about romantic fantasies. It is our ultimate fantasy. And the ultimate romantic fantasy is that uh, somewhere in the world is your soulmate and you will one day find her. And when you find her, you will know. You will hear violins, trumpets. You will see a shining light. You may hear a chorus of angels when you have that, that epiphany. This is something we all desire. We desire deep in our soul. But it doesn't happen. Now, you may have heard your grandma, your grandpa, everybody's grandma and grandpa has the same story. And that is, when I saw her, I knew she was the one. Um, so, um, <clears throat> but that is a what we call a romanticization of the past. <clears throat> Uh, so here you have a 30-year-old man in the story. He's looking back, and he's remembering this epiphany. And so we'll get to the epiphany in a moment. And it's the greatest epiphany in the history of all literature in, in Arabic. Uh, okay, but anyway, let's, uh, let's go to um, our uh, model here and just review this <clears throat> because, uh, like girl... <clears throat> In order to understand this story, you've got to get way beneath the literal uh, and diegetic level. Uh, and it's going to be <clears throat> very rich in the political and historical level, especially if you think about it in terms of uh, the role that Catholicism plays on the residents of the city of Dublin. Um, <clears throat> and allegorical or, and symbolic You've, you've, hopefully you've mastered this by now, and that is when you have a hero in a story, that hero represents men, okay, or women in the case of the narrator and girl, or the narrator in boys and girls, or the narrator in girl, okay, that uh, the girl in boys and girls represents girls. But it's important to place uh, those symbols in a political and historic level. Uh, because if you think about girl, girl is not as powerful unless you understand it from the historical perspective of colonialism. Okay, and that is here is an older woman and a young and a young girl who are trapped in the vice grip of colonialism. Well, guess what? Ireland is a colony of England, too, and it stays a colony until well after Joyce leaves Ireland. <clears throat> Ireland didn't become an independent nation until 1918, and all of Ireland didn't. It's still two separate countries. 
Ireland in the south and Northern, Northern Ireland in the north. And you may be wondering, why do they have two Irelands? And it's because of Catholicism versus Protestantism. Northern Ireland is Protestant and it is a colony of England. And the Protestants in Northern Ireland want to stay a colony because English gun-wielding soldiers are there because they're afraid that if they stop being a colony, the Catholics will rise up and murder them all. So anyway, so it's, it, uh, Araby is not just a story about Catholicism. It's also a story that has a uh, historical context of colonialism, that the, uh, the subject of the story, who is a boy, um, is a colonized subject. Not to the degree that you see in girl, not to that, so that not to that horrific degree, but it's colonial nevertheless. Just by way of a thought experience, just imagine if, say, Russia invaded the United States tomorrow and they brought all their soldiers and said, hey, guess what? Now you're Russians. You can't speak English anymore. You have to learn, you have to learn Russian. Um, at what point in your lifetime or your children's lifetime, or your grandchildren's lifetime, are you going to be okay with that? The answer is never. <clears throat> Rightfully so. <clears throat> All right, so anyway, so there's our uh, model, and think about that as we're going through the story. Let me toggle back here. Yeah, here we are. Uh, okay, so anything else? No, that'll work. Okay, so let's get to the story itself, and it is... Oh, there he is. There's James Joyce, uh, about uh, 23, 24 years old. He and Nora Barnacle left Dublin. Uh, she never came back. And uh, I'll say this in whisper tone, they lived in Seb. Uh, he didn't marry her until um, late in his life. He, was, he had very bad health for most of his adult life. And when it was clear to him that she was going to outlive him, they had a marriage ceremony. So uh, she would not get uh, <clears throat> cut out of his estate. Um, they lived in absolute abject poverty <clears throat> from 1904 until 1921. Uh, uh, what happened in 1921 was that he published Ulysses, Ulysses, the greatest novel ever written. And it made him a household name overnight. It is the greatest novel of all time. It will never go out of publication. So from 1920, 1921 until the rest of his life, he uh, was, uh, was, you know, he, he was making money. He had an actual estate. He did not want her um, cut out of that estate. So, so he married her. <clears throat> all right. So there he is. Good looking fella. Um, <clears throat> and here is the story. Okay, now I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the on the entire story, but I do want to spend a lot of time on these first two paragraphs. You know, I say these sorts of hyperbolic things all the time, but these are the two greatest paragraphs in the history of the English language. Uh, and the second paragraph is my favorite, is pretty much my favorite. Uh, it's, it's definitely my favorite paragraph of all time. But what you should know about this, what you should know about me, is this is my favorite thing in the whole world, Okay. Uh, this story that just is so dear to me, I just adore it. Uh, you know, <clears throat> other than my children, I don't love anything more than this story. <clears throat> ah, maybe my mom. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, Araby, and uh, what you should know that this is probably the last time I will actually say Araby like that. Of all subsequent references to Araby will be to the word <sighs> okay so paragraph one north richmond street being blind was a quiet street except at the hour when the christian brothers school set the boys free an uninhabited house of two stories stood at the blind end detached from its neighbors in a square ground the other houses of the street conscious of de decent lives within them gazed at one another with brown imperturbable faces. Okay. Okay, on the literal level, it doesn't look like there's a whole lot going on there. 
But what you should know about this is that this is a tour de force of a particular literary device. That literary device is called a personification. Uh, personification means attaching human characteristics to things that are not human. Okay, that's personification. And in this paragraph, there are six examples of personification. Now, I so Joyce wrote this when he was about 21 years old. And I have a theory that if he had written it 10 years later, he wouldn't have put so much in there. But I think it's a good thing that he did because he's young. He's got all these great literary tools to use. And so he really shows off in this first paragraph. It's very bold. But let's look at those examples of personification. All right. So the first is the word blind. North Richmond Street being blind. What does that mean? Okay. Can you guess? It means it's a dead-end street. So in, in America, we say uh, a dead-end street. But in the United Kingdom, and Ireland was part of the UK, they, they'll say a blind alley or a blind street. So North Richmond Street being blind, blind here means it is a dead-end street. Okay, but blind has a double meaning, okay? And that is, one, it is a dead-end street. The second meaning is blind, okay? Uh, and that is unable to see. Okay, but what you should first know before we get into the blindness aspect is that the fact that this is a story that starts on a dead-end street. What does that mean? What does that imply, you know, to be on a dead-end street? This is a dead end. We are on a dead-end street. Uh, and blindness is an interesting uh, word here. Um, because one of, the, one of the things that you know, Joyce liked to say when he left Ireland was that he couldn't stand the blindness. Okay, so there is uh, personification number one. <clears throat> it was a, uh, was a quiet street except at the hour when the Christian Brothers School set the boys free. Does he, what sets boys free? By the way, Christian, this is a private Catholic high, uh, school, private Catholic school for boys. Um, most private schools uh, in, uh, this story takes place around 1892, 1892, 1893, 1894. And so uh, most Catholic schools were, um, Segregate, right? So boys' schools and girls' schools. So uh, this, so what do you think Joyce is implying by saying that this the school set the boys free? Okay, what does that bring to mind? Uh, jail. Okay, that that is, uh, and and as you might guess, the Christian Brothers School is the school where James Joyce himself went to, but. Uh, Please do not fall into the trap of thinking that uh, James Joyce is the narrator, or this is some sort of autobiographical story. Uh, there may be autobiographical elements to it, but I, I can assure you that the person James Joyce is when he wrote this story is not the same person who is narrating this story. Uh, I think that James Joyce found a radically different path for his life than what appears to play out in this narrator's life. Uh, so I think, I think wardens liberate prisoners. Okay. Um, so uh, the schools do not set boys free. Uh, an uninhabited house of two stories stood at the blind end detached from its neighbors. Neighbors is the next, next example of personification. So who has neighbors? Human beings have neighbors. But here, an uninhabited house has neighbors. So you see what's going on there, and that is a, 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 a thing has neighbors. People have neighbors, not buildings. But here we have a building that has a neighbor. The other houses of the street, conscious of decent lives within them, okay, can houses be conscious? Of decent lives or otherwise. No, houses are not conscious. Hopefully human beings are conscious, not houses. Joyce knows this, but nevertheless, here we have the second example of, no, it's actually uh, the third example of a building that it has 
human characteristics. The school setting boys free, uninhabited house that has neighbors and houses that are conscious of decent lives within them, gazed at one another. Uh, that is, do the houses gaze at one another? No, human beings gaze at one another. So why are the houses ga gazing at one another? And then the sixth and final personification is the brown imperturbable faces, the faces. So human beings have faces, not houses. So here you have five examples of personification that are specific to buildings and one that is attached to a street. Uh, so um, think for a minute, why would <clears throat> Joyce be giving so many human characteristics to inanimate objects in this first paragraph? Well, on one, on one level, it is a, 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 an announcement of an extraordinary literary talent. Uh, but also, and uh, normally, I kind of save this for the classroom, but you know, conditions have radically changed. Because um, usually two or three students will identify the correct answer to that question. Why is Joyce giving human characteristics to inanimate objects? And the answer is because Joyce is hinting at the people who are live or people who are living them are dead inside. Okay, it it is it is the inanimate objects that have human characteristics, not the human beings who are living in them. <clears throat> so uh, anyway, so there's paragraph one, which is fun, but not really funny and actually kind of grim. Now anyway, paragraph two is, like I said, my favorite thing ever. Uh, in Within my favorite thing ever. Uh, ever. And this is where um, I hope that you will get an indication of just how carefully you have to read into the story to get at what's going on here. The former tenant of our house, a priest, had died in the back drawing room. Air, musty from having been long enclosed, hung in the rooms, and the waste room behind the kitchen was littered with old useless papers. Among these, I found a few paper-covered books, the pages of, wh of which were curled and damp. The Abbot by Walter Scott, The Devout Communicant, and memoirs of Vidoc. I liked the last best because its leaves were yellow. The wild garden behind the house contained a central apple tree and a few straggling bushes under which one of which under one of which I found the late tenant's rusty bicycle pump. He had been a very charitable priest. In his will, he had left all his money to institutions and the furniture of his house to his sister. Okay, so like I said on the literal level doesn't seem like a whole lot going on there, uh, and that is you find out that the narrator, you don't know who's talking yet, okay, the narrator is talking about our house, uh, and that is uh, the former tenant of our house. Um, <clears throat> so uh, he, like the priest, <clears throat> is he, he and his family are renting this house, and you kind of get the idea that it's a really kind of a rundown, crummy place. Um, and uh, let's go. And the priest is dead. Okay, what you should know about Joyce's short stories is that there are a lot of dead priests. Um, two of the first three short stories are have, and actually three of the first four short stories have dead priests in them. So um, I won't. I won't make any theories about that, even though I have some, but that's something you should think about. Okay, why are all these dead priests in Joyce? Uh, air musty from having been long enclosed, hung in the rooms, and the waste room behind the kitchen was littered with old useless papers. Uh, so the place that this, that this uh, boy uh, who's narrating, but remember, he's a boy in the story. He's not a boy when he's narrating. So this is a 30-year-old man having a memory. He's having a flashback, and he's remembering this uh, epiphany that you're going to see in the final paragraph. Uh, so uh, behind the kitchen, there's this, I don't even know what you would call this room, but it's just filled with a, all a bunch of with, with old books just everywhere. Among these, I found a few paper covered books, the pages of which were curled and damp. Okay, now here's what you should know. Uh, and 
hopefully this is something you'll bring into all your viewing and reading experiences. And that is if the writer goes to the trouble of giving you the name of a book in a book, that is meaningful. It's not some random piece of information. But when you're talking about when you're talking about literature, there's no such thing as a random piece of information. Uh, uh, everything has meaning. And when you're talking about Joyce, everything is overloaded with meaning. These three books are extraordinarily significant. The first is The Abbot by Walter Scott. Okay, so all these books belonged to the priest. And so uh, the first two make sense for priests to have. Uh, Walter Scott was a writer of romantic novels. Okay, he was he was from Scotland, but he was, as you might guess, a Catholic. Okay, and so uh, uh, I don't know what's in the library of contemporary Catholics, but you know, a hundred years ago, all Catholics had Walter Scott novels. Um, his most famous novel is Ivanhoe, <clears throat> um, and he still. Uh, he was a huge. He was huge 120 years ago, but not nearly as not nearly as big right now. Uh, and Walter Scott wrote adventure stories, what we call what were called romances. Uh, now we use the term romance a little bit differently, uh, but we still use it in a certain way, and that is a, a it is a story that involves love and adventure. Now, when we think of a romance, we just think of a story about a you know, two lovers, but a romance, you know, that's only half the story. Traditionally, a romance is a story that involves uh, an adventure, and it will have um, a little bit of titillation in there. You're going to have a hero and a heroine, and that is the hero's got to, got to, you know, he's got to rescue somebody. So that somebody is always a beautiful woman, and then they usually uh, ride off together into the sunset. <laughs> Uh, so that's a romance. <laughs> okay, does anybody know what an abbot is? That's the title of the book. Anyone? Okay. An abbot is a priest. Okay, so in The Abbot by Walter Scott is a story of a priest. The priest is a hero. So you can see why Catholics would love this book uh, because it, it's an adventure story where the knight in sharding armor is an actual priest. So this priest goes on an adventure and of course he rescues a damsel in distress, but Unlike other romance stories, there's no sex in the abbot. You know, the abbot and the damsel are not going to get together and get married, okay? Because let's say you only know one thing about priests. They don't get married, okay? They don't have sex. So uh, the abbot, it absolutely makes sense for any Catholic to have the, have the abbot in his library, especially a priest. Okay. The next book is called The Devout Communicant, and everybody in Ireland had this book. It is, uh, um, it's like chicken soup for the soul. <clears throat> the Devout Communicant was a book that every uh, Catholic had um, in, in all of the UK. Uh, so it's, it's a book that had like, one page would have like a Bible verse, and then it might have a song and then it might have a poem, and then it might have a prayer. So uh, it is, you know, thoughts for the day. Um, oh, okay, so the technical name for this type of book is a devotional. So it's a devotional book. So just think of, you know, uh, chicken soup for the soul. Uh, okay, but the third one is the best one. Okay, the memoirs of Vidar, which is something... No good Catholic would have in their whole neighborhood, much less in their home. Okay, so what you should know about the book Memoirs of Vidoc is it was the biggest selling book in the world in the, in the 1800s. Uh, and it was scandalous. So uh, Vidoc was a Frenchman. Uh, this book was written in the middle of the 1800s. And so he was a Frenchman who was a criminal. And he wrote his memoirs uh, late in his life because he had uh, become sort of semi-famous by, um, he was a small town crook, he was a gambler, womanizer, uh, street thug, he was a punk. 
Um, but when he got out of prison, he, um, he sold his services to the local police. And uh, 10 years ago, we had like three or four television shows like this. You know, it was criminals helping the police catch other criminals. The first guy to do that was Vida. So, uh, and when he published the memoirs, it was scandalous, but it was a huge, massive bestseller. Um, and you could probably guess why it was such a bestseller. And it didn't have anything to do with criminality or crimes or police cases. It had to do with the fact that V-Doc was an incredible womanizer and had lots of sex. So the memoirs of V-Doc are very sexy. So um, why would the priest have, uh, have a book like the memoirs of V-Doc? That's something you should consider. Okay, I mean, I'm going to get... So I need two books for this demonstration. Okay, I've got one here, but uh, let me see if I can find it. Hold on, one second. <clears throat> okay, so this is the way I like to think about uh, the memoirs of VDoc. So here is The Devout Community. All right, this is the book that you show. It is on top of your, uh, your, uh, your uh, living room table. You know, so when your guest comes in, it's right there on top. That is your coffee table book. Every, you want everyone to know that you have the memoirs of VDoc. Okay. Now, hidden away in your back room, you got the memoirs of VDoc. Scandalous. Okay. And so I always think of myself, you know, I always think of the priest as openly showing the devout communicant, but secretly reading the Val Communicant, I mean the memoirs of V-Dog, like this. Okay. And as it turns out, how he's reading it is also significant because the next sentence is uh, gives you probably way more information than you want to know. And that is the narrator says, I like the last best because its leaves were yellow. What do leaves mean? Pages. Why would the pages be yellow? Well, it's because the priest really, really liked that book, if you know what I mean, and I think you do. Welcome to the world of James Joyce. Anyway, <clears throat> next sentence. The wild garden behind the house contained a central apple tree and a few straggling bushes, under one of which I found the late tenant's rusty bicycle pump. I can't ever read that sentence without cracking up. Okay, so here you have the backyard. There's a bicycle pump standing up in the in the garden and it's surrounded by a bunch of bushes. I hope I don't have to explain that image to you. Okay, if 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 so, no, I'm not going to. Uh, anyway, the last sentence. He had been a very charitable priest. In his will, he had left all his money to institutions and the furniture of his house to his sister. Uh, anybody know how much money priests make? None. They don't make any money. They're priests. They work for the Lord. Okay. So, uh, but he had been a charitable priest, uh, meaning he was rich. Uh, so rich that he had a will. And in his will, he left all his money to institutions. Okay. What does that imply about the priest? Okay, if we go back to our model, okay, uh, one of the things that I did in class was uh, I showed you that this literal and diegetic level separates these other levels in one particular way, and that is the literal level is the information that is explicit. Beneath this surface layer here, you have the implicit meanings, okay? Uh, literal is explicit, and then the, all these other layers here are implicit, things that are implied. So what is implied in this information about the priest? Okay, uh, how, did he, how did he get to be charitable? Okay, how did he get enough money to have, A, to hire an, an attorney to draw up a will? And then what did he do with this money? He gave it to institutions. So let's say the, you know, the SPCA, uh, you know, the, you know, the local, 
fly fishing club, who knows, okay? He left his money to institutions. And the furniture to his sister, okay? That always cracks me up too. Now, if I was his sister, I'd be pretty upset about that. It's like, how come you didn't give your sister the money, <laughs> you, you priest? <laughs> but no, the sister gets the furniture, okay? It is, it is the Society for the Protection of Animals. They get the money, but the sister gets the, gets the furniture. Okay, so uh, there's a lot of implied stuff in here, especially those uh, those yellowed pages of the memoirs of Vidar. Uh, all right, so uh, what I'm not going to go through uh, every paragraph here, but what you should know is uh, I have a theory about this story, and that is that the narrator himself, even though he's older, does not really understand the implications of the story that he's telling. I don't think that the narrator himself knows how those the books got those how those the leaves of the memoirs of Vidoc got yellow. Okay, he doesn't he certainly doesn't make any comment about it other than hey that's I like that book because it's because the pages were yellow. Okay, uh, so he doesn't seem to understand the implications of that information. Uh, but here we're into absolutely brand new territory in all of literature. Uh, and that is. <clears throat> Joyce is doing this new thing um, that readers had never seen before. We're in a new layer. We're in a new level. Uh, okay, so with the introduction of the abbot as, as a plot point here, uh, the narrator has given you an adventure story, and he is describing his own story as if it were an adventure story. And he's using this very uh, romantic language that is language that would be uh, used in a typical romantic story. And you can see that in this third paragraph here, uh, <clears throat> where he's describing playing with his friends. <clears throat> so our shouts echoed in the silent street. The career of our play brought us to the dark, muddy lanes behind the houses where we ran the gauntlet of the rough tribes from the cottages to the back doors of the dark, dripping gardens where odors arose from the ash pits to the dark, odorous stables where a coachman smoothed and combed the horse or shook music from the buckled harness. So it's, it's what you would call evocative. So it's very moody, atmospheric. It is exactly the sort of language that you see in romantic stories. Uh, Okay, and here we have the introduction of the damsel in distress. Okay, so you've got a hero. Uh, by the way, I want you to pay attention to uh, the, the hero's identity. What is the hero's name? Um, and so here we have the introduction of the damsel. And then what is her name? Or if Mangan's sister came out on the doorstep to call her brother into his tea. Now that means dinner in the UK. We watched her from our shadow peer up and down the street. We waited to see whether she would remain or go in, and if she remained, we left our shadow and walked up to Mangan's steps resignedly. She was waiting for us, her figure defined by the light from the half-open door. Her brother always teased her before he obeyed, and I stood by the railings looking at her. Her dress swung as she moved her body, and the soft rope of her hair tossed from side to side, which is a beautiful gorgeous romantic image. Uh, so if, if it's true that Joyce is making fun of romantic fictions, he sure does a really expert job of mimicking it. Uh, next paragraph, every morning I lay on the floor in the front parlor watching her door. Okay, so now you know that this is a boy that is in love. He is in love with a girl across the street, and, uh, and he spies on her every day. Um, and he would follow her as they walk to school and find out the end of that paragraph. I had never spoken to her except for a few casual words, and yet her name was like a summons to all my foolish blood. What name? Go back, look. What is Mangan's sister's name? He doesn't give you her name. That's hilarious. So this is his dream girl, his first love, and he does not recall her name, okay? Or forgets to tell you her name, but you don't know her name. So far, you don't even know the narrator's name. Uh, and if you think about 
um, girl and you think about boys and girls and you think about the narrator from the yellow wallpaper, what does it mean to none of whom have names? Okay, I hope you notice that. What does it imply when you have a character who doesn't have a name? Okay, on one hand, it means they represent, so the girl represents girls in boys and girls. Okay, uh, the, the narrator in the yellow wallpaper represents women. But it also has a deeper meaning, and that is to not have a name means to not have an identity. Okay. Uh, all right. And so, because it's a uh, because it's a romantic story, he has to go on a romantic uh, he has to go on a romantic quest. And so, there's a quest within a quest. So this is the first quest. Okay. And that is he goes he goes to the local market with his aunt and uncle. There's another thing to consider, and that is he doesn't live with his mom and dad. He lives with his aunt and uncle. We don't ever find out why. Why is he living with his aunt and uncle and not his mom and dad? So what does orphan, what does being an orphan imply in a work of literature? He doesn't have a name and he doesn't have parents. All right. Uh, anyway, his aunt, uh, he, he, uh, he uh, accompanies his aunt to the local market to, market to do their sh Saturday shopping. Okay, and it's this loud, bustling place, lots going on. Uh, um, <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> one evening I went into the back drawing room in which the priest had died. It was a dark, rainy evening. It's always a dark and rainy night in an adventure story, right? And there was no sound in the house. Through one of the broken panes, I heard the rain impinge upon the earth and fine, incessant needles of water playing on the sodden beds. Some distant lamp or lighted window gleamed below me. I was thankful that I could see so little. All my senses seemed to desire to veil themselves, and feelings that I was and feeling that I was a about to slip from them, I pressed my palms and my hands together until they trembled, murmuring, Oh, love! Oh, love! Many times. So this is a this is a guy who is in the grip of romance. Fellas, you probably remember this. Yay, that is this first love that you have. You are really feeling it. These, the intensity of your feelings are overwhelming. So we see this, and I think that this is actually realistic. Of course, certainly based on my own... Um, experience uh, for my falling in love with uh, uh, for the first time. I remember it very well. It was with the actress Elizabeth Taylor. I was crazy in love with her. Okay, uh, so um, I know these feelings. <clears throat> At last, she spoke to me. When she addressed the first words to me, when she addressed the first words to me, I was so confused that I did not know what to answer. She asked me, "Was I going to?" Araby. Now notice, Araby is in italic font there. Why? Okay, why would James Joyce put Araby in italic font? Um, <clears throat> so, uh, but Araby was like this traveling um, fair, all right? And it had this like Middle Eastern theme, Arab, right? Um, and so it was meant to be really exotic and fancy, and uh, it came to town in Dublin. Uh, and so he and Mangan's sister are walking to school, and she looks at him, and she asks him if she's going, to, if he's, if he's going to go to the the big event in town. Okay, so this is before the movies. Okay, yeah, so uh, something like. I mean, it's like the circus coming to town. So this is a big deal. Everybody is going to go to this fancy new traveling uh, fair. So sh what she says to him is, hey, are you, gonna, are you going to the Araby? But he doesn't hear that. What he hears is, are you going to the Araby? Because when he hears that word, he attaches an aura to it. He attaches a significance to it that it doesn't have in of in itself, so this uh, this italicization of the word Araby is just solid literature gold, because uh, she says Araby, but what he hears is Araby. 
I forgot whether I answered yes or no. That always cracked me up too, because he's the one telling the story. You'd think he'd know some of those details. It would be a splendid bazaar, she said. She would love to go. And why can't you, I asked. While she spoke, she turned a silver bracelet around and round her wrist. She could not go, she said, because there would be retreat that week in her convent. Okay, now here you, here you need to take a moment there to think about that word, convent. Okay, who's Mangan's sister? Okay, Mangan's sister is training to be a nun. Okay, and so she's going on a weekend retreat with her fellow nuns in training. Okay, so uh, I don't know if you know anything about nuns, but they're like priests. They don't get married. Okay, so uh, this is a romance you have just found out that is going nowhere. Um, but <laughs> he doesn't seem to be paying attention. Okay, the light from the lamp opposite our door caught the white curve of her neck, lit up her hair that rested there, and falling, lit up the hand upon the railing. It fell over one side of her dress and caught the white border of a petticoat, just visible as she stood at ease. It's well for you, she said. If I go, I said, I will bring you something. Okay, so now the quest is on. Now we're on the quest for the Holy Grail, all right? Um, although I have a theory about this. I don't think Mangan's sister said, it's well for you. Because I don't think any 13 or 14 year old girl has ever said, it's well for you. I think what she probably said is, Eh, it's okay if you go. Okay. Um, but, you know, 18 years later when he's recalling this story, this is how he's remembering it. Okay, so he is attaching this aura and romantici romanticism to the story. And so it's, uh, I, I don't know if, I don't know if any 14-year-old any girl has ever said, it's well for you. But he says, if I go, I will bring you something, meaning it's on now. Now it is time to, uh, to go on the quest for the Holy Grail. He is on a quest. He is going to go to the Araby, and he is going to get her a gift. Um, and so he has to wait, um, I'm thinking probably four days before he can go to the Araby. And uh, scholars have looked into it. There was an actual Araby and they've uh, traced the story and what they have determined that uh, the narrator can't go to the, uh, the Araby until the very last day of Araby. Uh, so he has to wait until the last moment before he can get to go. <clears throat> All right. The syllables of the word Araby were called to me through the silence in which my soul luxuriated and cast an Eastern enchantment over me. I asked for leave to go to the bazaar on Saturday night. My aunt was surprised and hoped it was not some Freemason affair. I answered a few questions in class. I watched my master's face, that would be the school teacher, pass from amiability to sternness. So you kind of get the feeling that before, before he was a really good student and now he can't concentrate anymore. So now his teacher is really upset with him. It's like He hoped I was not beginning to idle. I could hear him at the front of the classroom saying, I say, whoever your name, whatever your name is, I'm, I hope you're not beginning to idle. I could not call my wandering thoughts together. I hardly any patience with the serious work of life, which, now that it stood between me and I, my desire, seemed to me child's play, ugly, monotonous child's play. On Saturday morning, so Saturday is the last day of the bazaar, and uh, he has to wait so on Saturday morning, I reminded my uncle that I, was, that I wished to go to the bazaar in the evening. He was fussing at the hall stand, looking for the hat brush, and answered me curtly, Yes, boy, I know. Now, why did his uncle say it that way? Yes, boy, I know. Okay, because if you remember when you were 12 and Christmas was coming, chances are you remind your parents of Christmas at least 417 times a day. Okay, so in those four or five days that he has to wait to go to Araby, he's been reminding his aunt and uncle every single day, I'm going to the Araby on Saturday. Don't forget, I'm going to the Araby on Saturday. Don't forget, don't, don't forget, uncle, whoever you are. As he was in the hall, I could not go into the front parlor and lie at the window. So he 
So you can't spy. I can't spy on her when the uncle's in in the room. Uh, okay. Um, so he's wandering around all day. You know, it's like Christmas Eve, right? You know, it's, it's like four o'clock in the afternoon. You're looking out the window, going, "It's it's getting dark, right? It's time for bed, right?" So um, he's he just time is just it's the slowest thing in the world when it when it's something you desperately want. So he cannot wait to go to the attic. But he has to wait for his uncle to come home. Um, all right, anyway, let's go down here. Uh, and when I came downstairs again, I found Mrs. Mercer sitting at the fire. Now here is Mrs. Mercer, by the way, is the only person who has a name. Okay, so you have Mangan's sister, okay, and that is the sister of the narrator's best friend, Mangan. But his name isn't Mangan, that's a last name. He doesn't give you his friend. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. When you, your best friend, do you call them by their last name? Right. You know, my best friend when I was that age was named Jeff. He's still my best friend. Okay. Uh, his last name is Leitner. I've never called him, hey, Leitner. Okay. I've only called Jeff. But here it is. Mangan's sister. And the only person who has a name is the least significant character in the story, Mrs. Mercer. Uh, although I like Mercer because it is similar to the name Murchison in uh, A Raisin in the Sun, and it means merchant, okay? So uh, that there's, there's a whole PhD dissertation in there for you if you want to look into that. Why is this woman named Mercer? She was an old garrulous woman. Garrulous means talks a lot, so talkative a pawnbroker's widow who collected used stamps for some pious purpose. Uh, okay, whatever. And and uh, he's sitting down there, and she, Mrs. Mercer's talking away, and then her aunt says, so it's getting late now. By the way, the, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the Araby closes at 10 p.m., all right? And so time's running out for our narrator. It's starting to get dark. And his aunt says to him, I'm afraid you may put off your bazaar for this night of our Lord. At nine o'clock, I heard my uncle's latch key in the hall door. Okay, he's only got one hour to get to the air. I heard him talking to himself and heard the hall stand rocking when he'd received the weight of his overcoat. I could interpret these signs. Now, that's an amazing sentence because... He doesn't tell you what those signs mean. He said, I could interpret these signs. Well, hopefully you can interpret those signs. What are the signs? I heard him talking to himself and heard the hall stand rocking when he had received the weight of his overcoat. He was drunk. Okay. Furthermore, last sentence of that paragraph, <laughs> heartbreaking. He had forgotten. Can you imagine your parents forgetting Christmas? And then he said, the people are in bed, and after their first sleep now, he said, I did not smile. Now, I don't know what's going on there. I think that the uncle is trying to make some kind of joke, but I don't get it. And I've done lots of research in Arabic, and I, and I haven't found out what that means. So I don't think scholars have tracked that down. Uh, uh, my aunt said to him energetically, can't you give him the money and let him go? You've kept him late enough as it is. So you can see that the, the aunt is a little put off by the uncle's shenanigans. Um, all right. So finally, uh, go a couple of paragraphs later. Later, the uncle gives him money. <clears throat> I held a florin. I can't remember how much a florin is. So, um, <clears throat> but, a okay. So a pound is their, is their, is their money. They're, they have the, we have a dollar, they have a pound. So uh, a pound right now is about a dollar fifty. Uh, a pound in 1894 would have been about five dollars. So his uncle, I think a florin is a pound. So his uncle gives him five bucks, and he has to take the train to the bazaar there and back. <clears throat> okay, and then he has to pay to get into the bazaar, and most importantly, he has to buy. Mangan's sister a gift, okay, because that is his quest. Uh, so he has to, but first he has to walk to the train station and then take the train to the, the outskirts of town. There was actually a special train to the Araby, 
and then he has to uh, and then he has to go back so I mean he doesn't even I mean I'm thinking he doesn't even get to get on the train until maybe 9 10 p.m. okay and he has to wait for the train to leave uh, I took my seat in a third-class carriage of a deserted train. It's the last night, okay? Place was packed in the first week. Uh, very few people were going nowadays, especially this late in the day. Uh, and, and he takes a third-class carriage. That is the least expensive carriage uh, because he wants to have the most money available to buy a gift for his true love. Okay. Uh, after an intolerable delay, the train moved out of the station slowly. Don't you get the feeling that it probably wasn't an intolerable delay? It probably wasn't a delay at all. Uh, so he gets out. And what you should know about the bazaar is that there were expensive entrances and inexpensive entrances. So he is desperately looking for the cheap entrance, but he can't find one. I could not find any sixpenny entrance. And fearing that the bazaar would be closed, I passed in quickly through a turnstile, handing a shilling to a weary looking man. A shilling is one twelfth of a pound. Okay. So we're talking, I don't know. So what's one twelfth of five dollars? Okay. So, uh, I don't know, 50 cents. Yeah. <clears throat> I found myself in a big hall girdled at half its height by a gallery. Nearly all the stalls were closed and the greater part of the hall was in darkness. I recognized the silence like that which pervades a church after a service. Okay, so here he is comparing the uh, this bazaar, this uh, traveling service, this traveling fair. Okay, but ma basically it's like a it's like a flea market. <clears throat> um, so he is comparing a flea market to church. I walked into the center of the bazaar timidly. A few people were gathered about the stalls, which were still open, before a curtain over which the words "Café Chantant." were written in colored lamps. Two men were counting money on a salver. Café Chantant is, is, is meaningless. Okay, Chantant, there's, that's not a French word, although it does come from the, um, it's, it does, it's like a derivative of the, of the French word chanson, which means song. Okay, so uh, it's like café, song, sing song, but it's a nonsensical word. But, Hey, you know, it's, it seems French, so it's got to be fancy, right? Remembering with difficulty why I had come, I went over to one of the stalls and examined porcelain vases, oh, sorry, vases, and flowered tea sets. At the door of the stall, a young lady was talking and laughing with two young gentlemen. Okay, now those are very important terms. Lady and gentleman are technical terms for uh, aristocrats in the United Kingdom. Um, so if you were a lord or a duke or a, a, a viscount or a, an earl you or a sir, you were a gentleman. Okay? If you were a duchess or a dame, you were a lady. Uh, so <clears throat> guess what? Aristocrats don't work at the Arabian. So these, these are not lady. This is not a lady and gentleman. This is, a, this is just a, a young woman and young men. It's the last night of work, and it's like 10 minutes till 10, and they are uh, kidding around, and they're having the most significant conversation in the history of literature. I remarked their English accents and listened vaguely to their conversation. Okay, and here is this conversation that he remembers. Oh, I never said such a thing. Oh, but you did. Oh, but I didn't. Didn't she say that? Yes, I heard her. Oh, there's a fib. There's the conversation that your narrator remembers. Okay. Uh, and it's the silliest, most nonsensical drivel that's ever been put down in the English language. Why did Joyce put it in here? It's because of the English accents. Remember, this is in Ireland, <clears throat> and so you have, it's a traveling show, and so the people who work there are from England. And so the Irish think about English accents similar to the way we think about English accents. So if we think about English, when we hear an English accent, we think, ooh, fancy. 
And chances are, in your local radio station, if they really want you to buy something, they'll get somebody with a with an English accent, you know, to to try to sell it to you because that if you know, that's it's going to sound really significant and fancy if it's coming from uh, if it's said in an English accent. Uh, and the, and the, the Irish accent is seen as rough or coarse, insignificant. <clears throat> Even the Irish themselves are sometimes ashamed of their accent, <clears throat> uh, especially if you consider them being colonized, right? That is, they're English landlords. They speak in proper King's English. <clears throat> So he hears English accents, he assumes that they're really fancy people, and they give you this conversation that is not fancy. It is just stupid. Okay. Uh, and I don't know, just something you might want, to think, might want to think about. What's James Joyce doing there? Why would he include that piece of, that, that, that dialogue in there? Observing me, the young lady came over and asked me, did I wish to buy anything? The tone of her voice was not encouraging. She seemed to have spoken to me out of a sense of duty. I looked humbly at the great jars that stood like eastern guards at either side of the dark entrance to the stall and murmured. So we still got this romantic language he's using, but I kind of get the feeling that it's petering out by, by the nearing the close of the, of the era. He says, no, thank you. The young lady changed the position of one of the vases, <clears throat> sorry, vases, and went back to the two young men. They began to talk of the same subject. That just cracks me up. What's up there? Once or twice, the young lady glanced at me over her shoulder. Okay. Now, <laughs> what's going on there? Why would you be looking at him over her shoulder? <laughs> Let's make sure he's not stealing. Okay. I lingered before her stall, though I knew my stay was useless to make my interest in her wares seem the more real. That's how nice this kid is. He's looking at uh, this, this cheap you know, stuff made in Japan, okay, and pretending to be interested in it because he doesn't want to hurt her feelings. Okay? Then I turned away slowly and walked down the middle of the bazaar. I allowed the two pennies to fall against the sixpence in my pocket. I heard a voice call from one end of the gallery that the light was out. The upper part of the hall was now completely dark. So there is your epiphany. Now, if you've see, ever seen an epiphany in a comedy show or a cartoon, how do you see it? It is the light bulb that goes off, goes on uh, over the hero's head. That is the epiphany. This epiphany is the reverse, okay? And that is it, occur, it occurs in the upper part over the head of the narrator when the lights go off. Okay, so it is a reverse epiphany. You know, the light bulb not going on, but the light bulb going off. And then we have uh, my favorite sentence of all of the English language. Gazing up into the darkness, I saw myself as a creature driven and derided by vanity, and my eyes burned with anguish and anger. The end. Okay, so he has experienced his epiphany. And what is his epiphany? His epiphany is, life sucks. Now remember, this is a 30-year-old man who is remembering this story. Uh, and so, uh, so why would he tell you this story? Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, my, my, own, my own theory is, you know, it sounds to me like it's something over drinks, you know. It's like, how did you get... How'd you get to this condition, Joe Bob? <laughs> well, let me tell you, it's like this. Okay, <laughs> everything, everything went to hell. You know, when I was twelve. Okay, and this is how it happened. Okay, so he's telling you the story. The epiphany he has is that life is meaningless and worthless. Okay, now you may think that's grim, and you may be angry at James Joyce right now. It's like, why would he waste my time with this story? But what you should know is that James Joyce is making fun of romantic stories. Okay. Uh, and that is, uh, I think about this narrator and think to myself, really, is that, is, that, is that all the evidence you needed to come to that conclusion? Okay. Uh, so, and I want to assure you that life is not meaningless. Okay. Life is actually quite good and enjoyable and, 
and can be wonderful and, and spectacular. Okay. Uh, and Joyce believes that too. But I believe that Joyce believes that in order to really enjoy your lives, you have to disencumber, your, disencumber yourself from these romantic fictions because those romantic fictions are lies. Um, so uh, in order to tell that story, though, he's using an older man who has been beaten down by the romantic fantasies. If you, just, if you subscribe to them, they're just going to beat you down. And I think that that's true even for people today, deep, deep, deep into adulthood, maybe their entire lives, you know, they've been waiting around for their true love and it never comes, okay? And uh, it, 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 those romantic fantasies have destroyed people's lives, okay? They've destroyed their relationships because chances are you do believe that there's your soulmate is somewhere in the world and you must find them, okay? And Joyce and me, we don't believe that. Okay, uh, and that is, you know, there are decisions that you make, and there are people that you love, and you need to treasure those uh, people, and you need to foster those relationships, uh, and you and you need to be responsible about the decisions that you make. Uh, okay, so there you have it, uh, Araby. So please give me two paragraphs on Araby, and. Uh, for the Tuesday, Thursday classes, your deadline will be on Thursday. And then for everybody else, your deadline will be on Friday. Okay, so look to eCampus for other information. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, I will talk to you soon. And... <clears throat>